Today's episode of the show is brought to you by AG1 from Athletic Greens. More on them in just a bit. If you were to take a vacation traveling up the Norwegian coastline, you'd be treated to some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. Deep, plunging fords, craggy, mountainous islands, and several of the largest glaciers on Earth. But traveling northward from the Seven Mountains of Bergen toward the picturesque city of Trondheim, you might be surprised when one of the rocky tunnels you drive through just keeps on going and going and going. At a total length of just over 24 and a half kilometers, Norway's Lardal Tunnel is the longest road tunnel in the world. Eerily beautiful, carefully designed, and built to serve the needs of the people traveling through it, the tunnel is a fantastic example of human factors engineering done right. In order to understand why the Lardal Tunnel needed to exist at all, we've got to account for the unique demands of driving in the world's northernmost regions. The area of Norway where the tunnel was built is a mountainous landscape, pockmarked with fords and natural boundaries. Beautiful, absolutely, but also a bit of a pain to navigate. During the 1990s, the Norwegian parliament was in the process of trying to make this area safer, cheaper, and easier to move through, building a new highway that would be the main artery between Bergen, Norway's second largest city, and Oslo, the capital and largest city. But one particular zone of the highway, situated between the small towns of Orland and Lardal, was proving to be especially thorny to work with. The roads in this area were especially unreliable, partly due to their narrowness and the high likelihood of bad weather during the colder months, and partly because of a particular risk of rock falls. So today's video is brought to you by AG1 from Athletic Greens. Look, for those of you who are new to the channel, AG1 is a nutritional drink that I've been drinking for some time now. It's a good couple of years since they started sponsoring me, and it has become a staple of my routine. Look, I typically make this stuff when I get to work in the morning, brew a cup of coffee, shake up my Athletic Greens, and I just find it simplifies my wellness routine. I used to take a multivitamin and that kind of stuff, and now it's just like, boom, AG1. Easy. Plus, also, it tastes pretty good. Like, it looks weird. It's kind of like green. You're like, ooh, okay. <laughs> but it tastes pineapple, vanilla-y. It just tastes good. Now, this is obviously, once it's already made, what you do is you essentially, well, you keep this in here, and uh, then you take a scoop, you put it in the thing, you add a little water, and you shake it up. Super easy. Plus, on the back, it lists all of the stuff that is included, keeping you nice and healthy. And do remember to keep it refrigerated once you've opened it. But the best part is that if you guys use my link below, you can get a one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3 and five travel packs for free with your first purchase. That's these things, the vitamin D, the travel packs, keeping you healthy on the go. So to take advantage of this offer, why well, you can just go to athleticgreens.com slash megaprojects or just click the link in the description below. So there you have it, AG1 by Athletic Greens. And now back to today's video. And fun fact about Norwegians, they actually tend to be generally against getting their cars crushed by boulders, so that just wouldn't do. But the terrain would also have made any large-scale earth-moving operation difficult, as the existing infrastructure was not suitable to get heavy machinery where it would need to go. Finally, the area between the two towns was mostly empty and possessed stunning natural beauty, not the sort of thing that Norway wanted to spoil by running a highway through it. The answer to this, of course, was to build a tunnel, and both then and now, tunneling is an area where Norway holds a particular expertise. But this particular one would have some unique demands, considering its length. Norway is ahead of the field in a lot of ways when it comes to this sort of engineering, but perhaps nowhere more so than their keen awareness of the importance of human factors engineering. That is, not just building something, but building it in a way that reflects the characteristics and limitations of the people who are going to use it. Norway understood that in their super long tunnel, this would be especially important. After all, driver attentiveness, fatigue, claustrophobia, or unexpected crises could all lead to an emergency situation where first responders might take a long time to arrive. By designing a tunnel that got ahead of those issues, Norway stood a better chance at reducing the risks involved with sending traffic through such a unique space. A team of experienced psychologists worked closely with engineers to design the tunnel, which was expected to take about 20 minutes in total to traverse. 
Because of the high-speed traffic that passes through, the tunnel had to be designed so that passengers could see ahead of them for at least 1,000 meters at any point, but keeping them alert would also be another problem entirely. The team used simulations to figure out what kind of lighting levels worked best in keeping people's focus while illuminating the road, and how to make the road curve, rise, and fall enough that someone would have to keep paying attention while operating their vehicle and still maintain visibility. The final design called for the tunnel to divide into four sections, separated from each other by three massive caves inside the mountain. These were meant to give drivers an opportunity to stop, stretch out, or take a rest. If they were dealing with such intense claustrophobia that they were beginning to regret entering the tunnel, they would have the opportunity to turn around at the first cave, rather than having to carry on the entire way or try turning around in the middle of the road. The tunnel would be lit with blue and yellow lights meant to simulate a rising sun, alternating back and forth with stretches of white light meant to wake people up. Fire extinguishers, turning areas, kilometer markers, and emergency stop-offs would also be clearly marked, both to stop people from getting too nervous and to continue to spruce up the interior of the tunnel to keep people from nodding off in the low light. Taken together, the design group hoped that the tunnel passage would be pleasant for drivers and also keep those drivers operating their vehicles without creating risk for someone else. The construction of the tunnel took place in four phases, drilling, blasting, loading, and landscaping. The process had to be extremely precise, especially the blasting element, since construction that dug into the mountain from both sides would have to meet up in the middle, a full kilometer underground and 10 kilometers inward from either direction. It's difficult to express how hard this would be to do analog, but you could basically imagine a couple of blindfolded archers trying to shoot their arrows directly towards one another, hoping that the arrows would collide head-on in mid-air. That's before we even consider that Norway wasn't attempting a straight shot. Instead, they would have to climb some 260 meters in the process, while including bends and turns in the tunnel design. Of course, by the 1990s, neither Norway nor any other developed nation would have to do this sort of thing in analog. Instead, Norway used computer-controlled jumbo drills paired with traditional drill and blast techniques, leveraging navigation satellites to guide their path into the mountain. Laser beams were used to keep the bearings of the tunnel, and a computer-controlled mechanism used this laser data to automatically position drilling equipment for the major boring process. Other parts of the tunnel were dealt with the old-fashioned way by drilling some holes in the rock, sticking dynamite in them, and trucking out the debris. This process was not without some issues. Because of the immense pressure that the mountain above exerts on the tunnel structure, rock bursts were not uncommon. At one point during construction, weakness in the mountain's interior caused about a thousand cubic meters of rock to fall from the tunnel ceiling. This required a major recalibration, as the entire affected area had to be filled with concrete and the tunnel rerouted. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Once rock was dislodged within the tunnels, it was brought out in dump trucks that used fresh new road inside, which was being constructed just a little way behind where the blasting was taking place. Once the tunnel was blasted and the road was paved, more workers followed behind, touching up the tunnel walls, blasting out the three main cabins, and installing all the lighting, signage, and other equipment to make a functioning road. The whole process moved along at a pace of about 60 to 70 meters per week, moving inward at each face of the tunnel. The biggest challenge in constructing the tunnel was figuring out what to do with all that extra rock. The project excavated a total of 2.5 million cubic meters from the mountain, which, if you remember, couldn't just be scattered around the landscape that Norway was trying to preserve. Instead, the builders decided to construct a secondary access tunnel about two kilometers long, which fed out the side of the mountain into a little valley known as Tingedal. Here, this metric fuck ton of rocks can sit safely tucked away with no risk that the debris would pollute local waterways. Ventilation was a second obstacle in the tunnel. After all, even if a constant stiff breeze from one end could reliably keep air moving through 24 kilometers of caves, that does very little about all the noxious pollutants that cars leave behind as they pass through. The tunnel uses a single air exhaust shaft with an air quality treatment plant, the first in the world to be dedicated to a single road tunnel housed in a small side tunnel that filters out major pollutants. This allows the tunnels not to draw on too much power, and while a person probably shouldn't hang out sucking fumes at the side of the road all day, the air quality is consistently monitored so that it doesn't pose any risk of harm if a person, say, wanted their windows down while driving through. Finally, fire and emergency preparedness took on the highest importance when finishing up the tunnel. In enclosed spaces like road tunnels with limited oxygen, no room to turn around, and very little space to disperse a fire, flames can burn with an extreme intensity, and flash over combustion within clouds of smoke becomes far more likely. A year before the Laudal Tunnel was opened, 39 people died in a fire in the Mont Blanc Tunnel in France, and a year after it opened, a fire claimed 11 lives in Switzerland's Gotthard Road Tunnel. 
So when it came to the Lardal Tunnel, Norway wasn't willing to cut corners. The dry rock around the tunnel and its fire-resistant cladding were a good start, and advanced monitoring technology was installed all up and down the tunnel to ensure that any problems with the ventilation systems, emergency equipment, lighting, or traffic signals would be known as soon as they happened. Fire extinguishers and emergency telephones are set up at uncommonly short intervals, and the tunnel is set up for rapid closure and evacuation should it ever be needed. Upon its completion, the Lardal Tunnel became the longest road tunnel in the world. The tunnel is 24.5 kilometers long, 9 meters wide, with a peak interior elevation of 265 meters, running at a 2.5% grade for most of the way through. Reinforced by 200,000 rock bolts and 45,000 cubic meters of shotcrete, the tunnel is safe, sturdy, and well insulated against collapse. In 2019, the tunnel saw just over 2,000 vehicles per day, and in the years since it opened in September 1999, only a handful of accidents have taken place. One of those, just before the opening day of the tunnel, put its fire preparedness to the test. A bus with about 50 passengers caught fire while deep inside the mountain, but no one was hurt, and the bus was eventually able to leave under its own power. That's not to say that the tunnel hasn't had its problems. Speeding has become commonplace inside, either by drivers who lose focus and begin to lose track of how fast they're going, or by people who take advantage of the tunnel's relative emptiness and seclusion. In response, Norway has installed speed cameras inside and set up photo inspections and automatic measures to keep track of all the vehicles moving in and out. When crashes do occur, it could take emergency vehicles a long time to reach the victim's location, and there have been several fatalities due to crashes in the last several decades. But all things considered, the tunnel is seen in Norway as a safe, reliable section of road. It's become a tourist attraction all its own, and it's even hosted the occasional wedding. Those who drive through the tunnel often remark on the peace of mind granted to them by Norway's design choices, pointing out that although it may be easy to feel claustrophobic or threatened in such a small space, the cabins and clear emergency preparedness really do help drivers to stay calm and collected. Travelers also point out the strange, almost forlorn beauty of the three main cabins and the unique feeling of traveling so far while feeling so acutely aware that an entire mountain lies overhead. For the people of Norway, the Lardal Tunnel ensures that they can pass through their country by road quickly and efficiently, and not have to be worried about getting hit by boulders.